What is happening, everybody? Welcome to Off the Rails, a recovery podcast dedicated to ending the stigma of addiction through open discussion on all things recovery related. My name is Mark. We have Dave here next to me. And today we have a very special guest. We have Reverend Rex Shades Eagle. Rex, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're very thankful that you're taking the time of your day to come and come and speak with us. You know, as I mentioned to you before, uh, every Thursday we release an episode where we we bring guests on and we share their stories in hopes that it can help others struggling. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I feel like I'm the one who's honored to be here. Uh, <clears throat> you know, any chance that uh, that we have to share our stories to, so that we can help each other connect, like I'm all on board. You know, uh, I was an addict for 27 years without no connection. So mm-hmm. now I just want all the connection I can get. Absolutely, man. So Rex, um, <coughs> let's start it off here. Um, where are you from, man? Uh, so I was born and raised in uh, New Jersey, uh, South New Jersey, the real dirty South. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was born, um, I was born in South Jersey, and the day I was born, I was taken away from my. I think it was within the first hour of my birth. I was taken away from my mother and I was taken to Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. where for the next month, uh, they proceeded to stretch my asshole because apparently my asshole was too small and I couldn't poop. And uh, so that's that's a real thing. Um, and uh, it's funny. I, the only reason I bring that up is because I've done since since getting clean and sober this time, I've done a lot of work on trauma. Um, and trauma healing and just how deep trauma can go and how far back it can go, you know, and there's, they're showing now that like trauma can go all the way back to the womb, mm-hmm. you know, and they're also, they also understand now that uh, when a child's born the first nine months, it needs constant contact with its mother, um, especially in the first, like now, like most hospitals, when a baby's born, they just give it to its mom and everybody leaves a room for like the first hour. Um, or at least that's how they're doing it out here on the West coast in, in the U S but, uh, I was taken away from my mom a couple months later. I got, I got, I, she came to see me one time. So in the first month of my life, I got to see my mom for 30 minutes. Uh, and then <clears throat> I guess when my biological father got my mother pregnant, my mom's dad <laughs> went to him and put a gun in his face and said, you're going to do right by my daughter. Or I'm going to bury you in a ditch somewhere. And so they got married, which in hindsight was not a good idea. He joined the Marine Corps because he figured joining the military would be a way to get on track and take care of a family. So at f- about three months old, we left New Jersey for Paris Island, South Carolina. And uh, I guess within a month or so of moving down there, he had already beaten her and me bad enough for the cops to be called twice. And the second time the cop, the sheriff told my mother, if we have to come again, we're taking him. So I guess they had to come again. So she was like, let me call my parents. So she called her parents. They drove from New Jersey to South Carolina overnight, got me, took me back to New Jersey. Fast forward, I find all of this out on my sixth birthday when I'm sitting in a courtroom all day with the man that I think is my dad. And the judge at the end of the day is like, well, Mr. Walter, it looks like he's not coming. So I'm going to we're going to go ahead and award you the the adoption final and he's yours. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, you know (laughs) what? At the drive home, I, I asked my dad, I'm like, dad, like, what was that about? He was like, well, there's some things you should know. So he tells me all this. He's like, I'm not your real father. He's like, I'm actually your real mother's father. I'm your grandfather on your mother's side. But legally, I'm your father now because I just adopted you. So <clears throat> try to, I mean, this sounds confusing now and I'm almost 49 years old. Imagine how hard this was at six years old. So then a few days later, he asked me, he was like, hey, if you had to choose who you were going to live with, me or your mom, who would you choose? So, you know, I'm a, I'm a six-year-old boy. My dad is my hero. He takes me fishing. He plays Chinese checkers with me. He makes my older brother let me watch what I want on TV, you know? <laughs> so, and like my mom, she makes me do chores, homework, you know, take baths and stuff like this, you know, eat vegetables. 
So I'm like you. Little did I know at six years old that this would be the most important decision I ever made in my life. Because a couple of weeks later, around the beginning of February 1980, um, my, my birthday is January. Uh, so about a month after my birthday, we moved out and moved in with the woman who would become my stepmom. Within a few days, she started smacking me around. Um, within the first month, I would say within the first two weeks, um, she beat me over the back of the head with a soup ladle so bad uh, that I had to go to the hospital and get stitches on three, uh, three cuts on the back of my head. Um, she, st when we, we went to see my, the story was that she's like, you're going to tell your dad, you're running through the kitchen and slipped on the, on the floor and hit your head on the dishwasher. So that's what I told him. And on the way to the hospital, she pulled the car over in a dirt lot and she turned around and looked at me in the back seat. And she said, if you ever tell anybody the things that go on in our house, I'll kill your dad. She's like, I may, she's like, you may get away from me. I even, may even go to prison. She's like, but you'll have to live the rest of your life knowing that because you couldn't keep your mouth shut, your dad is dead. So that's exactly what she needed to say to get me to never say anything. Um, the abuse continued. Uh, it got worse. She started sticking the, she liked kitchen utensils, uh, soup ladles, uh, heavy like wooden spoons. She liked to strip me down naked and then beat me into submission. Her favorite thing was, though, uh, she used to get an old White Pages phone book. And uh, for all you youngsters out there listening, a White Pages is a phone book that used to have residential landline phone numbers on, in it. Uh, they weren't quite as thick as the Yellow Pages. And one of those little, um, she would take a, a phone book and one of those little uh, baseball bats that they give out, like fan appreciation at the ballpark, but they're like real wood or they're just like a miniature bat. And she would pin me down and hold that on my side and beat me with it because it didn't leave marks. She, she was good. She knew what she was doing. But then she would, she would strip me naked, pin me down and beat me until I wasn't fighting anymore. And then she would take like rubber bands and snap them on my testicles and on my junk or like stick the handle of whatever she was beating me with up my ass. Like she was really sick and twisted about three months after we moved in my two teenage stepbrothers, uh, started coming in and forcing me to give them head. Um, that went on for about three years until I fought back against them. Uh, they came in one night, I pulled out a knife. I said, it may not happen tonight. I said, but if it comes near me again, it's mine. And uh, so that stopped. And then that's around the time that her sexual abuse stopped. The beatings didn't stop. They just got more, uh, more focused. Like before, up until I was about nine, it was every day. <clears throat> then uh, I guess it was about eight years old. Because, you know, up, up, in, up for the first couple of years, year and a half or two years, I just tried to be good. I was like, maybe if I'm just good, she'll stop hitting me. You know what I mean? Like, I must be doing something. Well, that didn't work. So <laughs> at some point, I, I was just like, you know what, man? If she's going to beat me, I'm going to deserve it. You know? Uh, and I just started acting out. And. When I started acting out, it kind of put like a little focus on the family. Like, um, so the beatings slowed down, but they it would be more like once or twice a week, but it would be like really, really intense. Um, till I was 12 years old, when I was 12 years old, I fought back and I beat the shit out of her, busted up the whole side of her face. Um, I went to juvie for a night, got out, came home, um, had a, my arm was broke because what started the fight is uh, she came at me with like a little piece of one by one wood and she took it up like she was going to swing for the fences. And like, I remember 12 years old, I just turned 12. It's like two weeks after my birthday. I remember it just snowed. It was cold outside. That's why me and my younger stepbrother were inside and why she got all pissed off because we were being loud. And I remember like time stopped. And there was like this voice in my head that said, if you don't stop her, she's going to kill you. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow, but she is going to kill you if you don't fight back. And I just remember time like snapped back on. I put my arm up and I heard the bone break when she hit me with that board. And I hit her. I hit her with six years of pent up anger and frustration. 
And I don't remember anything after that except waking up in county. Um, I already had a splint on my hand. So, like, I, I must have been in shock or something. I, I don't know. Um, not county, uh, Judy. And so I get out the next day. My dad comes and picks me up, takes me back to the house, and he has an army duffel bag packed with a bunch of my clothes and cassette tapes, like my Walkman's on top. And uh, he tells me, he's like, get out of my house. Don't ever come back. So we go out, we go, we go round and round for a little bit. And then finally I'm like, all right. I was like, if you really want to choose her over me, I was like, I have some conditions. I was like, you can't tell anybody that I don't live here anymore. I was like, especially mom. I was like, and you have to pay for my food. And he was like, fine. And uh, they were on, we were on food stamps back then. And that's back when uh, in the U S food stamps used to be paper money. Um, I don't know if it was ever like that in Canada, but, uh, so every week I would go see him and he would either give me a 20 or a $50 food stamp so I could eat. And uh, I didn't want child protective services involved because in New Jersey back then it was called DIFUS, Division of Youth and Family Services. And their solution would be to take you completely away from that part of the state and put you in a foster home in another part of the state. Well, I knew kids that they had done that to. I went to school with that were from North Jersey that they had moved down to South Jersey who were getting molested, beat. They talked about how like, how like even the older kids in the, in the foster homes would like molest you. And stuff. I'm like, I don't want nothing to do with that. So that's why I made, I told my dad, we got to keep this under wraps. Um, and I left and within, I'd already done cocaine once. Uh, I walked in on my older brother and, one of my friend's older brothers, and they had a, what to my child memory was a mountain of cocaine and a bunch of syringes. And uh, somehow, some way at like 12 years old, right after, it was like the day or two after my birthday, I talked my 17 year old brother into shooting me up with cocaine, um, which wasn't a problem for him because at this point I was already drinking regularly. Um, I was smoking pot. And within a couple of weeks of getting kicked out, me and my best friend Miles were, we decided to go to Camden, New Jersey, which is right across the bridge from Philly, and try to find some Coke. And we ended up running into this old, old black guy, man. He must have been in the 70s or 80s. And he took us back to his house and introduced us to heroin. And the first time I did heroin, I had found the answer. I didn't even know I was. Lo- I didn't even know I was looking. I didn't even know there was a question, and I immediately fell in love. I knew. I knew for a fact that it was what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life, and I knew that life wasn't going to be long because I couldn't even imagine having to deal with adulthood. Um, my idol was Sid Vicious, you know James Dean. I was in the rockabilly punk, and I wanted to live fast, die young, leave a good looking corpse. And uh, I was off to the races, man. I um, I gave my soul to heroin. You know, I've, I've, I've always viewed heroin as like a feminine, like chaotic energy, um, at least to me. I, I used to say she, she, was my, she was my longest and dearest mistress. Um, but we, we had this agreement. Heroin said, I will give you relief. I will give you solace. I'll shut up the voices. I'll silence the noise. And in return, all you have to do is give me everything. And I was, I was like, okay, where do I sign? And I signed in blood. Right. So fast forward a few years, I'm 17, I'm about to be 17. I'm 16, about to be a senior. And I decide I want to get my life together. I have an opportunity to get a ride for baseball um, Rutgers University was looking at me for a scholarship and so I stopped I stopped getting high I stopped shooting up I stopped doing heroin and cocaine I, I went through all the withdrawals I got clean I just pretty much turned into an alcoholic uh, and made it through high school I didn't graduate because even though I played sports some, for somehow I didn't have enough PE credits so I was just like screw this I went and got my GED they let me walk with my class. Two weeks before the start of academic school year at Rutgers, I get on the back of a motorcycle to go to a house party 
in Canada, New Jersey, and a drunk driver runs a red light and we T-bone him doing about 55, 60 miles an hour. I was ejected off the bike. I landed 175 feet from the point of impact. Um, I landed on my head and then the left side of my body slammed on the ground. Uh, first responders were on site for uh, 22 minutes before someone walking from the party that I was headed to seen my ox blood Doc Martin sticking out of a juniper bush. They looked in the bush and seen my helmet cracked in half and me all mangled and twisted up and bleeding. Um, my leg, my shin, I wasn't trying to show you. My, my uh, <laughs> shin was broken half. I had a compound fracture on my shin. My bone was sticking out. I, I don't remember none of this. This is all just what I was told, you know, by everybody and read the reports and stuff. They flight for life me. I spent 73 days in a coma, uh, eight and a half weeks in traction. I had to learn how to walk again um, and lost my ride. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I was on painkillers and stuff, but I wasn't abusing them because I still didn't want to be a heroin addict. And uh, a few months go by, I get my settle. I get, I, I took the first deal they offered me, you know, I was about to be 18 years old there. They, they came at me with six figures and I was like, yes, <laughs> please. I'll just take all that money. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, I was like, anything you want to do, anything you want to do, we'll go do it. She's like, I want to go see the Grateful Dead in Philly. And I was like, oh, I was like, man, anything but that. Like I said, I was a punk rock. You know what I mean? Like the Grateful Dead to me was just like some burnout hippie country band that like, you know, is that freedom rock? Turn it up. You know what I mean? Like, and, uh, but I was cool. I was like, all right, we'll go. And we bought tickets and on the lot, the parking lot, I met some punk rock hippie kids. And uh, I was like, man, you guys are into this shit. And they're like, bro, they're like, are you going inside? I'm like, yeah. They're like, here, handed me a quarter of mushrooms. You guys have a good show. I smoked kind bud for the first time. I was, I took, they like gave me a green hit. I was like, oh my God, what is this? And he's like, weed. And I was like, what's it laced with? He's like, weed. Because <laughs> I had just been smoking some Virginia ditch weed. So like, there's all these like new experiences that I'm experiencing one night. And then I go in the show. Steve Miller band opened up for him. And like, that was like pretty much one of the only classic rock bands that I liked. So I knew everything they played. And then the only Grateful Dead song that I could have told you at that time by name was Touch of Grey. And that's because in the 80s when the video came out with the, skull, with the skeletons playing the instruments and stuff, that was the first song the Grateful Dead played. The first show that I went to and I was hooked. I was peeking on mushrooms and I was like, this is the most amazing fucking thing I've ever done and seen or heard of in my life. Went for the next two nights and then a uh, dude handed me a business card. It said 1-900-RUN-DEAD. It was like next three dates, three venues, whatever and uh you could call and it would tell you where the next three shows were on what dates he's like you ever want to find me here's my business card and uh they left i tried to talk my girlfriend into going she wasn't having it i hung out for about three four days and then i was gone i left new jersey and i didn't look back there's one thing man like that was the reason that i stopped doing heroin when i was 16 because <clears throat> i'm from a small town in new jersey where nobody ever leaves and like they just sit in the bar, drink their life away, work some bullshit union or teamster job, marry some woman that they don't love, have a bunch of kids that they fucking hate and are horrible. Half of them beat their wives. Half of the wives deserve it. Like, I mean, these people, it just like sucks the life out of you. And then they die. And all of a sudden everybody talks about what a fucking saint they are. And I'm like, I cannot have this. It's like, literally, I feel like I'm living in the Sopranos and, uh, so I left and uh, I ended up in San Francisco and then I went to Las Vegas met, to meet my biological father for the first time. My family, my in-law, my father's side of the family got a hold of me. They're like, Hey, you're your dad. I'm like, he's not my dad. And they're like, well, Tom senior wants to meet you. Cause my real name, my biological name is Thomas Francis told junior. Uh, I changed my name for a whole lot of reasons, mainly because Senior is a rapist and a pedophile, um, and I no longer wanted to be associated with him. Um, that's the main reason. But uh, so I go out to Las Vegas to meet him. The first day I meet him, he's like he's he's like two hours late to meet me at the bus station. So I'm sitting there playing, you know, like little nickel slots in the, in the bus station. 
And he finally shows up. As soon as he walks in, I knew it was me because it was like a fatter, older, way uglier version of me. And I was like, oh, my God, I hope that's not what I'm going to fucking look like in my 40s. And uh, he comes over and we're walking back to his hotel. There's pretty much everybody in Vegas that lives there that's not wealthy stays in a hotel. They're like week, weekly or monthly motels. And we go, we're walking back to his motel. And he's like, so you like to do cocaine, huh? And at this point, I hadn't done cocaine in like almost two years. And uh, I was like, no, nah. I, I was like, I used to. He's like, what about speed? You ever do speed? And I'm like, no, nah, they don't really have speed where I'm from. I was like, that's like, I guess the bikers do. I was like, well, we, we have cocaine. We don't really have crank or nothing. And he's like, have you ever tried it? <laughs> and I'm like, no. And he's like, do you want to? And I'm like, I don't know, man. Let's, let's, just, let's just wait and see what happens. So we get back to his motel room. His best friend's there. And for the next 20, 30 minutes, they just sit there and pretty much badger me into fucking smoking meth with them. And uh, so I do. We smoked an eight ball of meth in one fucking night. And they went to sleep. And I sat there and chewed all my fingernails off and freaked out for three days. They went to work, did their thing. After three days, I fall asleep, wake up. All my money, my ID, my pa- like all my stuff is gone. He's gone. He moved out of the motel while I was passed out from this meth binge. I ended up seeing him a few months later because I, I was off to the races. Like I did not want to not do meth again because it was the most exciting. And this wasn't like the meth now. This was like biker bathtub crank that like it wasn't like the stuff that they have now where like you do a little bit and you're up for 14 days. Like this is stuff that like you could party get fucked up for a day or two. And then you just crash and you sleep for a day. So like, I was just off to the races, the big lights. I was gambling. I was homeless. I ended up homeless weighing like 125, 130 pounds living off of the free saltine crackers and ketchup mustard and relish that they had at slots of fun for their hot dogs that they sold. I would steal a cup and fill it with relish, mustard, and ketchup and sit there and use it as a dip for salty crackers. And that's how I sustained myself for like six months. Then the Grateful Dead came to town and my deadhead friends found me. They helped me get my shit together. I didn't leave, uh, but I got on my feet, still doing meth. Then about 11 months in, I was living with this meth cook named Aunt Carolyn. Everybody called her Aunt Carolyn. And I'm sitting in her living room. I had been up for about a month. Like literally, I think I was on 31 days. I hadn't slept. Um, She had started cooking this new recipe that she called glass, which is pretty much the stuff they're doing now. And uh, she's like, man, you got to try it. You got to try it. She's like, but it's really good if you mix it with the peanut butter. So I'm like, all right, man, I was, I was trying because all these old, junkies are like oh you just got to keep getting high man and you'll eventually crash you'll eventually crash it's called over ramping you can't overdose you'll be all right i'm like okay man and i just kept going like i'm like a human pin cushion at this point just trying to sleep so i i just did a big shot i'm sitting in her living room watching the tv and i'm watching cops in las vegas live and uh as I'm watching on the TV, I look out the window, cop cars pull into her horseshoe driveway. I'm watching it on TV also. I hear Thomas Francis Toll, come out with your hands on top of your head. We have the house surrounded. You have nowhere to run. Come out or we're cutting the power. There's probably about 15 pounds of fucking different kinds of meth in this house, not to mention the pounds of weed. And, but I mean, this is Las Vegas in the 1990s. Three marijuana seeds is a felony <laughs> back then. I'm thinking I'm done. I'm done, right? So what am I going to do? I can't do nothing. So I walk to the door. I put my hands on top of my head. I walk out. Two cops run over, grab me, slam me on the ground. I hit my forehead on the ground. I look up. There's no fucking cops. There's nobody there. I walk back inside the front window that I saw the cops pull up has blackout drapes covering it the tv isn't even in the living room the tv's in her bedroom i was sitting there looking at a fish tank i went in my bedroom i packed as many clean socks into a backpack as i could with a change of clothes i grabbed about a half a pound of weed 
stuffed it in the bottom of the backpack and I wrote a note and put it on the TV in her room <laughs> that said, Aunt Carolyn, got to go. Love, Tommy. I was gone. And I hitchhiked to the northernmost exit on I-15. And I don't know what it is now, but there used to be an AMPM there right by the Welcome to Las Vegas sign as you're coming in, uh, headed south from Utah. And I crawled into a cardboard dumpster because I was passing out. There was no fighting it. Like I was like, I felt like I was in fear and loathing with Las fear and loathing in Las Vegas. Like it was like everything was melting. And I just crawled into this cardboard dumpster, covered myself up, and slept for three days. I went when I went inside, the dudes inside were these young teenagers, and they were like, Man, we didn't let them take the dumpster for two days. We just wanted you to sleep, bro. We kept poking you with a stick to make sure you were breathing. I'm <laughs> like, thanks. Uh I hitchhike up to Salt Lake City, run into my dad, my buddies from, from tour, and I end up in Denver. And Denver was cool, man. Uh, Denver was where I, my nickname Shades. That's my that's my grateful, that's my dead tour nickname. That's where it really took. And uh I stayed in Denver for a little bit, and then I got a, I, I don't really remember why, but I ended up in Boulder in February. And uh it was dumping outside. It was snowing. We went to the homeless shelter and I ended up running into a friend of mine who I knew from tour who was doing some community service at the homeless shelter. And he was like, dude, fuck this place. Come back to my house. He's like, we'll just smoke some bowls, drink some beers, you can hang out. And uh, we stayed up all night talking, catching up. And I was about to crash for the night. And he's like, man, come out front and smoke a cigarette with me. I said, all right. It had snowed that night, like I said. And the sun was coming up and his, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Boulder, Colorado or not. If you haven't, you should. It's beautiful. But they have these peaks called the flat irons because they're just like these big iron ore peaks in the Rockies. And the sun was coming up and his front porch looked right at the flat irons. <clears throat> and he was like, come on, man, let me show you what home looks like. And I watched the sunrise and I've been here ever since. But uh, I stayed off heroin. I got off meth when, when I left Vegas. I, I stayed. I got off meth, and I stayed off of everything. But except I call them hippie drugs, like eggs, acid, mushrooms, and weed. Wasn't even really drinking. And then right before my twenty-first birthday, nineteen ninety-four, I went out to Oakland. Uh, it was the last time the Grateful Dead with Jerry played in Denver. <clears throat> it was uh, November twenty-ninth, thirtieth, December first. <clears throat> The first day I had all of my people from Colorado all coming because I was like, I got you guys. I'm going to hook you up. Like, don't worry. I know, I know all the connections, blah, blah, blah. The first dude I hooked up, he's like, I want to buy, uh, I wanted to buy a 10 pack, 10 vials. So I hook him up and he tells the dude that he was hooking up. He's like, Hey man, give my dude a puddle in his hand. I was like, yeah, all right, sure. I'll a few hits. The guy squeezes the bottle too hard. The whole bottle dumps out in my hand. So I'm off to the races now. Like I, I, my best friend stand there. I just smear some on his face. And then <laughs> I was listening. Uh, I'm going off. Well, over the next week and a half, somehow I ended up in this porta potty in Oakland, California, still tripping my face off. And I had traded this guy like 25 hits of acid for a quarter gram of some crank and a couple syringes. And uh, went into this handicapped porta potty with one of my best friends. And when I walk out, one of my Indian buddies, <clears throat> Native American buddies, was wearing a blue surgical glove. And he walks up to me and blows a quarter gram of raw crystal LSD in my face. Bam. Right after I just got done doing half a quarter gram shot of that. I'm rushing so hard. I can't come down. Days go by. I can't come down. I'm like going to bed, begging God, please. I don't even believe in God at this point. I'm like, please, if you're there, please just let me wake up not tripping. And it didn't happen. And after about a week and a half, I was starting to lose my mind. And this friend of mine <laughs> from tour, whose name was literally Junkie Donnie, uh, he was like, hey, man, he was like, heroin helps. And I was like, dude, for real? He's like, yeah, it does. He's like, it'll bring you down. He was like, you won't be tripping his heart he was like it'll calm everything down and he was right and as soon as i wasn't high anymore i was back to tripping so that was my excuse to keep doing heroin within three months i was back in boulder selling heroin for 
the Tijuana cartel. Um, and I was within a month and a half, I was selling about three quarter pounds of cocaine and heroin every three days in Boulder. Um, I had CU strung the fuck out. I had the whole hill locked down. I ended up getting busted uh, with 27 federal indictments and a RICO Act, which is an Organized Crime Act. Uh, after sitting and holding for four days, I met with my lawyer. First words out of his mouth. And this is a high-priced, high-dollar. This guy worked for normal, knew all the drug laws, had 50000 of my dollars in his safe on retainer. He walks into the hold into, into the conference room and the first words out of his mouth is you're fucked and I was, dude i just dropped my head i was like how bad is it he's like well he's like if we add up the total sentencing parameters he's like you're looking at 987 years so when i first started working for the tijuana cartel it was like a job interview i had to meet this dude because i was i met him through the 18th street sereños in southern california los angeles and they interviewed me. They had me give references. They wanted my mother's phone number and address, her work phone number, my dad's phone number and address. He didn't work. He was in Florida. She was in New Jersey. I gave them to him. They called my parents. They're like, oh, yeah, we're uh, we're doing background checks for a job interview. We're, we're, he's, he's a really good candidate. We're just, you know, finalizing, blah, blah, blah. Made it sound super professional, right? As soon as he's done with the phone calls, he turns around and looks at me. He says, now we know where your mother is. We know where your father is. We know how to find your whole family. If you rip us off, snitch on us or fuck us over in any way we will kill them and then we'll kill you and I'll, so i'm like you know i'm young almost i think i just turned 21 i felt invincible i've been selling drugs all around the country on dead tour for almost two years now right so i was like yeah no problem man you ain't gonna worry about it. i ain't a snitch i was like that's off the table fucking blah, blah 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 so i'm sitting here and my lawyer's trying to talk me into turning state's evidence i'm like dude they're, i'm like i'm a working class irish kid from new jersey bro i was like my family's dug in like fucking ticks and a fucking you know what i'm saying like i what are you gonna put 175 people in witness protection and try and hide us like come on man it's a small village bro and uh so i'm like you know i'm i'm fucked i'm, I'm just gonna have to do my time and uh so we're sitting there, we're going over the warrant. I mean, and it was like, like a tome, bro. It was like, you know, like, like reading the Bible. It was so legalese and wordy. <coughs> and uh, we couldn't find anything, couldn't find any loopholes. So he leaves, he leaves me with a copy of the warrant. And there was at the top of the page, it said, warrant to be served on the home occupants or dwelling owned by Thomas Francis Toll Jr. It said owned. That was the only word, not owned or occupied. She said owned. So my lawyer comes back the next morning before court. I was like, hey, man, tell me about this. And he was like, yeah. He was like, it's your house. I was like, yes, it's my house. But technically, it's not my house. I had this girlfriend whose grandmother was super cool to me. Well, then she went nuts. And she went to the state hospital on a under commitment. She lost her mind. She had a psychotic break. So when I bought my house and paid for it with a cashier's check, I put it under her name. So technically the deed was under her name. My lawyer, he like, I mean, damn your pops a boner. He was like, this is amazing. He was like, I'll, I'll see you in court. He leaves, you know, they, they get me, put me in my little handcuffs and shackles and stuff. And we go to the federal courthouse and they got closed circuit television because there's like, they followed me to the old Stapleton airport, watched me get on a plane to go to Colorado Springs, had the Colorado Springs field office of the uh, Colorado DEA and Colorado CBI pick me up down there. And then they watched me get on a plane to San Francisco. As soon as I did that, I became federal. That's how the feds got involved. And uh, so they busted like, I think it was 26. I think I was 27, the 27th person. Because I had also met my dude in Nevada. So they had like 27 people from three different states, all that fell under my warrant. Beat it on a technicality, walked out. When I walked out of the courtroom, out of shackles, the Boulder County Sheriff's Department was there with a warrant for my arrest. Because apparently when they busted me, 
I had a tenth of a gram of heroin in the little change pocket of my jeans. Now, when they busted me, I had a five gram of heroin a day, half an ounce of cocaine a day habit. My dirty cottons in my spoon had like a half a gram. I didn't even know what a tenth of a gram was. Clearly, they were pissed off because I beat them and they set me up. Like, but I didn't really complain because the most they could give me was three years, <laughs> and which is what they did. And I turned that three-year sentence into a 10-year sentence uh, from November of 1996 to November of 2005. I was free for a total of about eight months. I got out. The last time I went back in 2004, I got out. I was out for like six weeks, went back with a new charge, uh, completely strung out. And I had my first moment of clarity. I was laying in county jail. I'd only been there about 48 hours. And <clears throat> in Boulder County Jail, you got to get a bracelet with all your uh, classification information. And it's got like a barcode that the commissary people scan to make sure that it's you. Well, you can't even order food or hygiene until you have one of those wristbands. And I'm laying in my bunk and I've got this crate that they give you to put your stuff in. And it's full of food and hygiene. Because as soon as I walked in, everybody I knew me. They're like, oh, Shades, what's up, bro? Hey, man. oh, man, you look rough, dude. Here's some shampoo, here's some soap, here's some coffee, here's some cookie, here's some candy. You know what I mean? And I'm laying there and I'm like, man, I'm way more comfortable in here than I am out there. And that's a problem. So I decided to make a change. I decided from that point, I was like, you know what, man? I ain't fucking doing heroin anymore. I was like, oh, I'm just going to drink and smoke weed. So I started going to AA meetings in jail, in prison, with the mindset that as long as I don't do heroin, I'll be fine. So I get out. Within three days, I'm drunk. Within two weeks, I'm strung out. Within two months, I wake up on my 32nd birthday, and I'm surrounded, a whole house full of underage people, because the person I'm renting a room from is only 21, but her boyfriend is a 19-year-old college graduate who's invited all of his friends from high school to my birthday party. I'm on an ankle monitor on house arrest because I'm on parole. The liquor store across the street, the, to the stepping into the front door enough to make the doorbell not ding is 98 yards from my house. I have a hundred yard leash. <laughs> I used to go buy liquor, walk back to my house and drink it all night until I could wake up in the morning to go to Denver because I was allowed to leave from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for work. I was losing so much weight because I was shooting so much dope and so much coke that I was faking uh, um, doctor's notes. I was copying and pasting doctor letterhead on doctor's notes, convinced my parole officer and my job that I had a malignant tumor on the diaphragm of my stomach and that when I ate or drank too much, it made me vomit. And that's why I was losing so much weight. And I was drinking these drinks that masked my pee, so I wasn't pissing hot, so everybody believed it. So I wake up on my 32nd birthday, and I'm like, this has got to change. I live nine blocks from the parole office. <laughs> so I walk to the parole office, tell him what's going on. He has me do a UA. He's like, holy shit. I tell, he's like, what do you want to do? I said, I need to get into a program. So he has me go to detox. There was a lot more that went on to get me there. Um, I didn't go right away, but I ended up in detox a couple days later. And I met the guy who would be my first sponsor. And he, uh, the, the detox I was in was in a, on the corner of these two major streets. And it had a bunch of other buildings that housed a bunch of different mental health stuff. It's like where social services were and mental health and all these other things. Well, he, my first sponsor owned the company that cleaned them at night. So while his crew was cleaning and he was on on-site supervisor, he would just come over to the detox and 12-step drunks. And uh, he ended up being my first sponsor. We ripped through the steps. We were on the third step by like the fourth time we met. He gave me a notebook with some pens, took me to the store, bought me some hygiene, dropped me off at a two-week treatment program. and was like, you should have your fourth step done when you, when you, by the time you get out. He was like, you have five hours of free time that isn't classes for yourself every day. He was like, that's plenty of time to do your homework and write your four step. And I did. And at three months, I, I, I was, had already worked the steps, was still actively doing my ninth step as it came. I got my first sponsee and 
everybody started telling me how wonderful I was and my ego just like a balloon. And everybody kept telling me, if you want what they have, do what they do. So I thought that meant that if I wanted a cool car like he drove and had a hot chick like he had and a cool house like he had, that I had to get a job, a career and get a mortgage and get married and have kids if I wanted this real kind of sobriety. And so that's what I, that's what I did. I met a woman and I fell in love with her kids. And I thought that meant that I loved her and we ended up getting married and buying a ridiculously expensive house on foreclosure sale. And I had invested in 2007 in my about a year and a half. So clean and sober, I invested in a medical marijuana dispensary. And by this time, by the time I got married in 2009, I was making between 15 and $25,000 a month. And I was living ghetto fabulous. <laughs> I had a brand new truck. She had a brand new car. Our kids were going to private uh, Montessori school. Um, yeah, it was, it was ridiculous. And I was miserable. All I did was work and play poker. And while I was gone, she decided that she was going to sleep with the neighbor. And when she did that, that was pretty much all the excuse that I needed to just go right back into my old behaviors. And I was in a prelapse for about 11 months until January of 06. I mean, of 2012, about, I think it was about 10 days before my six year anniversary. I, thought high and I was off to the races like I mean bad I had about 80 grand saved up that she didn't know about and I burned through that in about a month then I started pawning off all my shit that I had bought with all that money and one of the some of the, I bought a bunch of stuff from this one guy on Craigslist and one of the things I bought from him was this five thousand dollar GT mountain bike and when I bought it from him, I had him meet me at my local police department, we ran the serial number, it came back clean. So I bought it. Well, fast forward three years, I pawn this bike, go back to the pawn shop and get arrested for false information to a pawnbroker. Because it turns out that this guy and his crew robbed this house of a family that was on a six month cruise. And he sold me the bike before it was reported stolen. And they said with my criminal history that there was no way I could have had no prior knowledge that I couldn't have not been involved. So they forced me to take a deal that I didn't want to take because I didn't want to go to prison. And I just wanted to get out of county and I got out, fought it off and on, relapsed off and on for about another year. Then I went back to county and I got out of July, got out in July of 2013. And within a few weeks, I relapsed again. But this time, something had changed. This time I, uh, I was high, but nothing was quiet. Nothing was silenced. The voices were still there. The trauma was still there. The self-loathing, the disgust was there, but now I'm high. So now I feel even more like shit. And for the first time in my life, I started to contemplate taking my own life. And, um, I climbed mountains and prayed about it, meditated about it. And, Everything about it felt right. There was nothing about it because, you know, from being in the program in, in AA and HA for five years solid, I developed a really good relationship and belief and faith in, in God. And uh, so now I'm praying to a God I do believe in <laughs> because I've seen the miracles happen in my life and I've seen the proof of God. And I'm like, please just, in my, just give me a gut feeling, something inside that tells me this isn't the right decision. And I didn't get that feeling. It was almost like I was being encouraged, like, 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 nope, nope, this is the, this is the right choice of action. And I had, my dealer was also an old friend of mine and he would let me stay at his house if it snowed or if it rained real bad. So um, about the middle of October of 2013, I just started praying for snow and on October 27th, 2013, it snowed, and I went to, <clears throat> we'll call him Donnie, because I don't want to say his real name, uh, went to Donnie's house and was like, hey, man, I have some guys that want to buy a couple grams in the morning. Um, 
I was like, you throw them to me and I'll pay you tomorrow. And he's like, yeah, man, no worries. And uh, at this point, I was just barely doing enough to not be sick. Like, I was not high at all because I wanted to get my tolerance to nothing because my plan was to intentionally overdose. So <clears throat> a couple other friends were there, a couple that we knew. Um, so we cooked dinner, we watched the movie, and then we were, they were getting ready to put on the sequel to the movie. And I was like, Hey man, I was like, is it cool if I go take a bath? It's like, it's been cold out all day. And he's like, yeah, man, no worries. He's like, there's some candles up there. I was like, cool. I brought some too. And I had made a playlist on my phone. And uh, the first song with the one I hoped I wouldn't make it through was uh, Heroin by the Velvet Underground. Um, I felt that it was a fitting. I felt at this point in my life that if there was one song that could define me and be the theme song of my life, that was it. And, um, you know, Lou Reed talks about in there, it's my life and it's my wife. It'll be the death of me. And I felt that that was fitting. And I, I fixed up two shots because it wouldn't fit in one. Ran a bath. As soon as the bath was done, I kind of stashed my stuff and was like, hey, anybody need the bathroom before I get in the tub? And they were like, no, it's, you're good. I got in, uh, hit play, did both shots. And I don't remember anything until I'm laying on the floor and they're above me crying and hugging each other and high-fiving and like looking at me, yelling at me. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know what I mean? And I realized what, what had happened. Uh, the next day I went and turned myself in because I was on the run for probation and there's no drugs in Boulder County jail. Like some weed might come through every now and then, or like, you know, people do psych meds and stuff, but I was never a fake drug kind of person. And uh, I went to my probation officer and I was like, Hey, I was like, I'm here to turn myself in. I was like, but I have a favor to ask. And she's like, what's that? My pro, my probation officer was cool as fuck. She was a really good woman. Um, I was like, I swore to myself last time I got out seven years ago that I would never be dope sick in jail again. I was like, can you get me in detox? And she did. She got me in a locked medical detox. And uh, I stayed for five days, signed myself out and walked back to, walked to the county jail, turned myself in. And uh, I decided because <clears throat> I knew that I never wanted to do heroin again. And I knew that I had to change everything in order to make that happen. And so what I did was I had gained all this insight in AA. And I thought because I was willing to talk about the fact that I had been raped by two middle-aged men when I was 13, beaten and left for dead. The fact that my stepmom beat me, my stepbrothers molested me, all this stuff. I thought because I had talked about it, that I was free of it because I had, I thought I had brought it into the light and that wasn't the case. So in County jail, I had the fortune of getting into this really good treatment program called JBBS jail-based behavioral services. And I really focused on, <clears throat> cause it says in all the literature, right? That using is but a symptom of our disease, right? And that, uh, the word alcohol or drugs is only ever mentioned once in the first step. Right. And Bill Wilson talks all the time in his writings outside of AA about the next, the, the, the next frontier is emotional sobriety. So I really started focusing on my childhood trauma. And I was sitting in this room with these guys that I had been doing time with for 20 years and they're crying. They're talking about being molested, and beaten and neglected. And these are men that I respected because even though they were criminals, they lived by the convict code, which is you don't victimize women, children, or elderly. And so I respected them. And I'm like thinking to myself, like, wow, I'm allowed to cry. Like I'm, we're watching Brene Brown videos and learning about vulnerability. And I'm like this, you know, big, tough, tattooed convict, you know what I mean? And like, I'm crying and hugging these other men and I feel good for the first time in my life. And I watched this video. It was like a 30 minute video about this guy who talked about how you can never really change your life and recover from anything until you're willing to change your personal narrative. until you're willing to change how you tell your story to yourself, because until you can change that, how you tell your story to yourself is how you present yourself to the world. So at this point, I told myself that I was a, child abused, neglected, homeless junkie who couldn't stay out of prison. Well, that's the person, that's the role that I took upon myself. 
So I really started to look at my trauma and my abuse as a child and the abusers. And I really looked at their stories. I like took myself out of my life and looked at it from a third party objective perspective. Like it was a movie with a lot of backstory or like maybe like a TV series that I could really get into the backstory. And ultimately I was able to find forgiveness for my stepmom and my stepbrothers and the men who raped me and my dad for not rescuing me and my biological mother for leaving and my biological father for what he did. And by forgiving all of them, I was able to forgive myself. And fast forward, here I am nine years later and I'm married to a beautiful woman, co-host of the podcast that I do. And she's the mother of my five beautiful stepchildren. Um, I published a book in January of this year called No Love, a memoir, K-N-O-W, Love, and started a podcast called No Love, the Memoir Continues, and <clears throat> really started to up my social media presence. And I got on TikTok for the first time. I was really reticent because I have teenage kids. <laughs> I've watched them on TikTok. But uh, I found out, discovered there was a huge recovery community on TikTok. Um, and I kind of blew up a little bit. I, I, I'm i up to almost 15,000 followers in five months. And uh, and it's petered off. It went up to like 14 in like two and a half months. In June, I started seeing all these men that I followed and respected on my For You page and that I fought in my following that were posting all this stuff about these statistics about suicide. And so in the United States, let me throw some numbers at you. In the United States, on average, 130 individuals a day take their own life. Out of that 130 individuals, 80% of those numbers was men. Out of that 130, 70% is middle-aged white men. And the other 10% are teenage boys and people of color. Well, I was 39 years old <clears throat> when I tried to take my own life. So this really started to resonate with me. So I started trying to figure out how I could get involved. There was the campaign. Um, it, I don't, know, I don't know if this is the same in Canada, uh, but in the United States, um, just like we have 911, if you're feeling suicidal, you can dial 988 um, or you can text the word talk to 741741. And this just happened in July. But I'm like, man, there's got to be more I can do. So I started reaching out to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And they were like, well, there's elections coming up. You know, you can write to your congressmen and senators and and candidates. So I did. I started uh, being active and I'm like, man, I, I still feel like there's something more I can do. So uh, I came up with an idea and contacted the local chapter or the rep for Colorado for AFSP. And he did some checking and we got to go ahead. So uh, we've started a year long fundraiser. We started it in September. Um, <clears throat> I have a nonprofit called the No Love Foundation. It's just called No Love Foundation, not the. Um, and we've partnered with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, over the next seven months, I'm going to be doing various speaking engagements to raise money. And then in June of next year, 2023, June 25th to be exact, um, I will be departing from Seattle, Washington and riding my bicycle from Seattle, Washington to San Francisco, California from San Francisco to Denver, Colorado, from Denver, Colorado to Washington, DC, and from Washington, DC to Miami, Florida. It's a 5,800 plus mile bike ride, and it's to raise money for an awareness for suicide prevention. You know, um, every 54 days in the United States, more people kill themselves than died in the Afghan and Iraq war combined, more US soldiers than more the u.s soldiers and like 22 on average a day of that number is veterans you know this means we're losing our fathers our brothers our sons our uncles our nephews and then the scarier fact is women try one and a half times more than men but men succeed almost four times more than women and <clears throat> you know like i i see TikToks and reports about your country <laughs> that you guys have, what is it, made medically assisted death. And like, and then there's other countries now where you can rent these pods and they'll deliver it wherever you want and you, they'll euthanize you to whatever view you want to die to. 
And I'm like, man, when as a society did life become so non-precious? You know, like I am so happy today that I failed. Like the night that morning after, like you never feel like such a failure as the day after a failed suicide attempt. But I'm so grateful for that failure today because I get to sit here with you guys and I get to sit here and tell my story. And hopefully, you know, there's something that I can say that will affect someone else so that they maybe can speak up and be like, Hey man, me too. You know, like I feel like this, there's this stigma in the world that men have to suck it up. We can't emote. We can't be vulnerable. We can't show weakness because if we show vulnerability, that means you're weak. That means you're a sissy or, or a pussy or you can't cry, man up. You know, like the mantra of all men, I feel like in the whole world is no one cares, work harder, you know, and that's not the truth. Like my personal phone number, my personal email are on my website, nolovefoundation.org. I fucking care. If you need somebody to talk to, call me, reach out for real. Like <clears throat> these numbers are ridiculous. And then you add on top of it, the fentanyl epidemic that's going on worldwide and in the U S like, <clears throat> I guess being here and being like nine years clean and sober now and being able to look back on my life and being so grateful and thankful for all of it, like every single bit of it, because it's made me who I am today. Like I, I talk to people like normies who've never really had any trauma or never really been addicted to anything. And I'm like, man, I feel sorry for you. Like You don't know what you're missing. Like, you know, you don't really understand the magnitude and the fullness of the life that you're living. Like we, like I call them muggles. We have the magic, you know what I mean? Like we, we understand. And I just feel like I could do something about it, you know? So that's why I've taken this on myself. And, um, you know, we have a GoFundMe set up um, and you can find it through the website. You can go to nolovefoundation.org or rideforlifeusa.org, the number four, not F-O-R, ride for life. Um, yeah, we ask you, you know, if you can help, help. If help could even mean just sharing it, you know, if you got 150 people that follow you, that's 150 people that will hear about it that may not have ever heard about it. Oh, Rex, man, awesome job. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, we're going to uh, we're, we're going to include all your information in our descriptions. Um, I don't even you. I think you answered all my questions. <laughs> yeah, you killed it. Uh, I'm I, I'm kind of I've uh. I've been doing a lot of these lately, trying to get the word out. You know what I mean? Trying yeah. to promote it because, um, the, will this be out before the 19th? Yep. Yeah. It'll be out, uh, okay. 17th, oh, I think maybe the 17th. 17th. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it come out right before. So people who are listening to this, this Saturday, uh, the 19th is, uh, international survivors day. It's to honor those who are left behind. Um, not those who tried and failed, but those who are left behind because they say on average for every person that takes their own life, six people are affected. So let's just say just in the United States alone, right? If there's 130 people who actually take their lives every day, that means 910 people are being affected by that death. The person who does it and the other six people, that is just ridiculous numbers. That's almost a thousand people a day being affected by something that is absolutely preventable mm -hmm. and the problem is is that it's not a big enough deal for the government to set aside entitlements so it has to be done through grants and things like that you know what i mean so and i have sworn uh it's on our website um and i have sworn to afsp we are going to follow their donation model um, I don't know how it is anywhere else in the world, but in the U.S., if you have a nonprofit, legally, you only have to give 20% of the money that you make to that cause, whatever it is. Um, we have decided to follow AFSP's model of 80-20. 80% of the money that we raise will go directly to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. The other 20% will go to helping me and my family as we train and prepare for the bike ride because it's going to be three months we're going to be on the road for three months yeah. and uh 
it's not an easy task. You know, um, I'm going to have to be riding about 90 miles a day um, just to keep on pace. And the average bike rider rides between 10 and 12 miles an hour. So that's about nine to 10 hours a day. And that's not even mentioning when I'm going over the Sierra Nevadas and the Rockies, you know, so, <clears throat> but it's, it's worth it. You know what I mean? Like, and just in the short amount of time that I've been doing this, I've already had several individuals reach out through TikTok and through the website and through other people who have shared the message, you know, the, the money isn't coming yet, but I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. You know, um, this isn't about the money. It's about raising awareness. The money is to help the outreach to make sure that if you, when you call 988, someone's there to answer that, you know, um, we're at these events, you know, like I'm, I'm over the next couple months, um, I'm setting up, I'm going to be on Sundays at Walmarts, and Targets and King Supers and grocery stores with my little booth and my signage set up trying to get people just, you know, to donate there and you know like i'm willing to put in the work because it's a cause i believe in you know um i didn't think that i had anybody or anyone who would cry if i died and the support and love that i got afterwards and that people just that i found and discovered who loved me until i was able to love myself and get the help that i needed I just want to do that for everybody else or at least somebody else, you know what I'm saying? And uh, help in whatever way I can. Rex, it's such a, such an important issue. And um, I just want to, I would like to thank you personally for raising awareness and uh, yeah. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. <clears throat> oh, anytime. And um, yeah, like I mentioned, we'll include all your information. Um, guys, please check out all Rex's stuff. Um, and it's such an amazing thing, Rex. Thank you so much for joining us. You guys, if you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please reach out and ask for help. Thank you so much for listening. And Rex, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh -huh.